Hi, everyone. I hope your day is going well so far. Um, for those of you on the West Coast, it's probably about lunchtime right now. Um, thanks for joining this afternoon for an exciting presentation on the genre of the pandemic film, which will be very, I suppose, apropos to the times in which we're living. Um, my name is Mary Beth Smith, and I'm the Regional Engagement Officer for various UVA clubs in California. I recognize some names on here from um, the UVA Club of Los Angeles, the UVA Entertainment Club of Los Angeles, um, and work with both of those clubs. So it's great to see you all tuning in this afternoon. Before we, we begin, I'd like to introduce the UVA Entertainment, Club of, of Entertain, UVA Entertainment Club of Los Angeles President Justin Paxton, who will introduce our faculty speaker, William Little. Justin. Hi everyone, uh, as Mary Beth just said, my name is Justin and I'm the president of the UVA Entertainment Club of Los Angeles. And on behalf of the board and myself, I just wanna say thank you for attending this afternoon. We are super excited to have Professor William Little, uh, Associate Professor of Media Studies, joining us to talk about pandemic films. As someone who taught at the Harvard School, which is now known as Harvard Westlake, William is also quite familiar with Los Angeles. His current classes include Breaking Bad, Once Upon a Time with the Pest, and whiteout, screening white supremacy. So as you can see, we're in for a very interesting discussion. As a reminder, you can always find our Facebook page at www.facebook.com backslash U-V-A-E-L-A. And for now, I'll pass it back to Mary Beth for a few, few logistical announcements and we'll get the show on the road. Thank you again. Great, thank you, Justin. Um, I'd like to highlight a few technical aspects of this virtual event before we begin. Um, as you saw, the video is being recorded um, enabling your video during this lecture is optional and your mic is already muted. If we could keep it muted until um, William engages the audience and ask for participation, that'd be great. And um, another thing that you're able to do for those of you familiar or not familiar with Zoom meeting, you can enable speaker view in the top right corner. Um, and then if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them in the chat box, which you see in the middle on the bottom of the screen in the middle. Um, and that would be wonderful because during the Q&A, um, I will call on, since we have a small group here, I'll be able to call on individuals who can ask their question directly to William. Um, so please, again, put them in the chat box and not directly to the speaker. And now I'd like to turn the mic over to William. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, welcome. Um, first of all, I'd just like to thank uh, the folks who invited me, um, members of the UVA community, extended community, to speak today. It's a, it's a pleasure, um, a welcome uh, compliment to my end of semester uh, commitments. And uh, it's also always a delight to, to share um, exploration of film. And uh, I understood uh, when the invitation uh, arose that uh, my uh, opportunity was to uh, speak about pandemic films, and uh, that, that's that's great. Um, I'm I'm happy to do that. Uh, it, it it is a a sobering uh, subject, so I'll try to keep it uh, as balanced as possible and not drag us down into the uh, abyss here. Um, so to do that, um, I, I'm going to to, to lecture some, but I also may ask questions along the way to try to, to invite conversation, um, which is my habit as, as a teacher. Uh, so um, pandemic, the pandemic genre, that, that was the phrase that um, uh, sort of functioned as the, 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 the gateway into the conversation today. And I wanna take that phrase apart, um, first by talking about genre, and then by talking about the pandemic genre because I think um, the whole concept of genre is intimately related to uh, the moment in which we all uh, live. So to do that, I'm gonna share the screen first and um, call your attention uh, to uh, the definition of the word genre and also to a, a related term, a, a term related etymologically, genre, uh, a Roman, uh, a term that uh, uh, describes a Roman clan embracing the families of the same stock in the male line with members having a common name and being united in worship of their common ancestor. That's a long-winded way of saying that um, built into the term genre is the idea of community, of a collection of people. And as I go forward, I'm actually going to um, illustrate how that's so integral to the dynamics of the pandemic genre, the concern about the social collective, 
about the family, about the Jean. Uh, so I'll pop back out now. So um, to, be, to talk about genre, I actually have to lead into it a little bit. So bear with me. Um, and I, I want to lead into talking about genre by connecting it to the historical moment in which we live. So I want to begin by su su suggesting the following, that a viral pandemic is the result of a genetic mutation. We probably all know that. And you're going to find out very quickly that I love playing around with language, but it's not just play. The phrase genetic mutation is related to genre. Genetics and genre are related etymologically. They have the same prefix. So a genetic mutation is by definition a kind of threat to the stability of a genre. The genre of a virus has been altered beyond the boundaries of the manageable or the, the, uh, the treatable. Uh, and a viral pandemic violates and collapses boundaries. And we, you probably know this, and I'll go into it at some length, but a genre is defined by its boundaries, what, what's collected in a genre and what's left out. And when I say a pandemic collapses boundaries, uh, I'll give you some examples. That a virus jumps across the, the boundary between biological groups. That's apparently how COVID-19 um, arose was that it was a, a jumping across uh, the boundary between bat and, and uh, human. Um, the virus, of course, jumps across geographical boundaries. It jumps across bodily boundaries. And it uh, also collapses the boundary between public and private. So that we're now all concerned about, you know, uh, what private space is free of the virus that's circulating in public. And and I'm having to think about this, we all are now for the fall perhaps, or if we ever go out in public, uh, what design of public space will effectively mimic the security of a private space? So the boundary between public and private is, is, is fragile at this point. The virus of course also blurs the boundary between living and dead. The virus is not alive, but it certainly can seem like it's alive, or it can, you know, it, it, it acts like it's alive. It also blurs the boundary between what's absent and what's present. You can't see it, it's invisible, but it certainly feels like a presence in our lives. It's an absent presence. When I was reviewing these films, um, one illustration for me that was as unsettling as any of this kind of collapse of boundary and this is just doing some film studies work for a second, it's gonna sound strange, is the cough. When somebody coughed on screen, that was as terrifying to me, and perhaps it's a reflection of where we are, as seeing a zombie on screen. And when I thought about the cough, I again thought about the blurring of a boundary. What's a cough? A cough is somewhere between sound and speech. It comes out of the mouth, it's an utterance, but it's not words. Blurs the boundary between nonsense and sense. So again, I'm talking about the, the, the blurring of boundary and the, and the threat of the breakdown of boundary. While I'm on this, this is well before we get to talk about the pandemic genre, I would just say that Zoom embodies the instabilities of boundaries in a pandemic. We're, we're living it right as, right as I speak to you, we're living it. You know, this is a space that we feel is secure, but who knows if it's going to be hacked, right? Private space, here we are together. Will the public infect it from the outside somehow? I would also suggest that when a screen goes dark or when an individual, this, this is, I, I'm, I'm trying to get used to this, but when an individual replaces a live feed with a still image of a self-portrait, I'm, I'm, I'm talking about blurring of boundaries. Now, is the person there or not? Is the person absent or present? Is the person inside or outside? Blurring of boundaries. Even if I can, even if both the audio and visual uh, uh, components are working in my connection with the other, that person's still somewhat an absent presence. You know why we get Zoom fatigue? Be for precisely that reason. We're trying to read the cues. We're trying to bring that person 
fully into the present, and yet in some ways that person's still absent. And absence made really graphic when this free, the screen freezes. Whoa, where'd they go? I'll get to the pandemic genre. Stay with me. Let me stop for a second. Any comments or questions? I can say something. I find it really interesting that you said that the cough became almost as scary as like, or you got as a reaction similar to you would get as a zombie when you're watching a zombie film. So I, I do think that there is sort of this feeling outside right now. Of if you hear someone cough, everyone's head kind of whips around. Oh, yes. Yes. Yeah, I'll talk about this film, um, which I think is the most realistic representation of, of the pandemic. Um, uh, experience, and that is Contagion, the Steven Soderbergh film. I'm guessing a number of you have now either seen it for the first time or rewatched it. And very early on, someone starts coughing. And I mean, in this context, it's just, it really is kind of terrifying. Um, very quickly, uh, just so I cover all my bases, I've been talking about how a viral pandemic uh, threatens to collapse boundaries. And that's, that's, that's scary, right? That's, 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 that's frightening. Um, at the same time, and I think this is equally terrifying, uh, the pandemic can also create very rigid boundaries, which heighten division. And I probably, I'm running through uh, some uh, examples with which I know you're familiar. The division between essential and non-essential work. The division between those who have access to technology and those who have limited access or no access to technology. The division between white people and people of color the division between the wealthy and either the middle class, the, the people who are falling out of the middle class, the poor. The division between those self-identifying as native and those identified by native as foreign or other, which we see in very striking, um, disturbing uh, manifestation now in a number of nations, not least, for instance, India. So, Collapse of boundary on the one hand, establishment of very rigid and um, uh, disempowering and oppressive boundary on the other. Here's where genre comes into play for me. Genre, from my point of view, acts as a kind of curative agent because genre establishes healthy boundaries. Collapse of boundaries here, Rigid boundaries here, genre, consoling, comforting boundaries. Let me give you an example. You go to Netflix. You're looking for what to stream. Where do you go? You might go to the list of genres where you will find something comfortable, familiar, consoling. Why? Because genre boundaries determine a category and the category makes a case. And to be able to go and find something that fits into a case is really comforting at a time where we're still trying to make a case out of COVID-19. Genre renders typical the otherwise radically transgressive. Oh yeah, that, that rings true. That's familiar. I know that genre. I'm comfortable with it. I'm going to play around with another word here. Genre entails a technique of curation. Curation. An algorithm or a set of people, my guess is it's probably an algorithm at Netflix, has to determine what goes into each genre on the platform. How does a film fall into horror or is it subgenre, Korean horror, documentary or mockumentary? There's a curative process that goes on. I'm playing with that word because curation is related to the word cure. Genre provides a temporary cure. Think of the person who composes the best of list according to a genre. The best of, the worst of, 
the so bad it's good list. That is a curation project. These are the top 10 pandemic films you should see. The list is an act of curation that distills. I'm playing on me medical metaphors here that distills, that boils down, that filters out, that purifies in some ways. Oh yeah, those are the 10 I need to see in quarantine. Comments, questions? I was gonna say, I think it's really interesting etymologically um, coming from a classics major that the curation cure, I think it, if I'm not mistaken, derives from the Latin word curo, curare, to meaning to care. And I obviously like curating, you're cur curating an exhibit, you're caring for it in that manner. And I guess cure, it's just really interesting how, how you did the play on words with the cure and the genre, the genre provides a temporary cure. I wrote that down, I thought that was really interesting. Thank you. So the genre then entails, and I'm, this is where I'm gonna um, transition eventually into consideration of the pandemic genre. The genre and uh, the, 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 uh, the system of genre um, involves not just curation, but collection. You bring a group of films together or a, 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 a set of pieces of literature together and you, and you house them, you archive them. And that becomes reassuring in some ways. To that end, I would like to show you, and I hope I'm not offering any plot spoilers, um, the very end of Contagion, the Soderbergh film. It doesn't really give anything away other than to suggest, well, the world doesn't come to an end. <laughs> uh, and what I, the reason I wanna show it to you is because I think you'll see an act of curation unfold at the end of the film. It makes sense. How are you gonna resolve a pandemic film in a way that doesn't just terrify people? Curation. Uh, bear with me for just a sec. Okay, um, to set this up, uh, these two figures have been instrumental in finding a, um, a cure for the disease. And uh, you'll see them come in with, and I think this is significant etymologically too, a case, a literal case, a physical case that they're gonna deposit here. Okay, what you just saw was the pandemic genre enacting curation. H1N1, MEV1, these different cases, these different films, if you will, well, they almost look like film canisters, right? Deposited in this archive. Those were viruses though, of course. Jump in if you want, anybody. You almost look back at it lovingly. 
Oh yeah. Like she, right. yeah, like you know. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's a really good. That's a really good transition, Justin. But I, I want to hear from other folks if you wish. Okay, so let me let me hold on to that adverb lovingly, and I, I think I can come back to that. So as I went back to to um, view um, pandemic films, I did what I guess any curator would do, perhaps certainly any scholar would do, which is that I began trying to um, to look for similarities or likenesses. I began trying to to collect themes or motifs that seem to run through the films. In effect, I was trying to create some order out of disorder, <laughs> which is what a genre does, okay? Uh, and as I did, I stumbled across something I had never thought about before, and that was the concept of the collection, the collection. And actually, I'd thought about it in some other courses. I, I had not thought about it with respect to pandemic, <laughs> and I, I stole it. Um, and what I came to realize um, here's sort of my thesis for today, is that the pandemic genre dramatizes a, a viral crisis as a crisis of collecting. Now, of course, that's, that's, that's being a little cutesy, right? Because it's, it's clearly a virus, it's a, it's a crisis that involves a threat to life. So I do not want to downplay that at all, a threat to life. But I think at another level, it also signifies this crisis of collecting. And I'm gonna to need to unpack that some, so bear with me here. I wanna show you something else. This is not a clip from a film. Come back to you for a second here. So when I woke up this morning, um, I, I stumbled across this first thing when I was looking at the New York Times. Um, and this is one of those, what you can do at home while you're uh, quarantining. And I thought, oh my gosh, this is just what I've been thinking about. This article is about how one can spend time organizing one's collection. Granted, this is those who have the affordance, the luxury the, of collecting a lot of books. Nevertheless, it, this is connected to what I have been thinking about, which is the power of collecting. And I'm gonna need to explain that a little bit. Okay, so what is the power of collecting all about? Um, what does it mean to create a collection? Well, first of all, what do I mean by a collection? When I'm talking about a collection, I'm not just talking about what you pick off the street and put in a trash bag. It's not like collecting garbage. When I'm talking about collecting, I'm talking about collecting objects that assembled together have a kind of substantial meaning to the collector. So each object has its own individuality, but it also fits in, follow me here, it also fits in with the group. So it's both singular and it's part of a collective. So for instance, stamp collecting bottle cap collecting, shoe collecting, photograph collecting, recipe collecting, album collecting, book collecting. To collect is to create a miniature world that promises nostalgia. What was the word you just used, Justin? I'm trying to remember it now. Lovingly. 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 Creates a miniature world, lovingly, that promises security and that also promises, and how tempting is this and desirable is this, permanence. You put those stamps together, you take them out of the sun, you take them out of circulation, you put them in a book, and they're there forever. An immunity to time's passage. I'll give you some examples from other films where uh, the, the project of collecting is a significant way to try to combat the threat of loss, the, the threat of uh, disease. I don't know how many, how many people have seen Hereditary, the horror film. Um, the, one of the main characters, a woman, is a, 
uh, an artist who uh, creates miniatures, like miniature doll houses, and she uses it as a, as a kind of buffer against the real world. A real world example of that, which um, was then made, uh, uh, sorry, was um, shared in a documentary and then turned into a fiction film is Marwin Call, about a, a man who suffered a terrible trauma when he was beaten badly. And he turns to creating the, this, these miniatures, uses toy soldiers and so on to build a world, a collection. The kind of collection I'm talking about has the magic property of warding off disorder, dissolution, chaos, infection, oblivion. It assures you the end of the world is not nigh. Let me stop there. Comments? I have one. This is Chanel. Hi, Chanel. Uh Hi, how are you? In Charlottesville last time I saw you. Uh, yeah, <laughs> now I'm um, tuning in from SF, but um, I have a question. Uh, so where does hoarding fit in Ooh. this kind of collective? Ooh. Because it seems like hoarding is taking that mini world to an extreme and then creating disorder. Yes, great, great question, great question. So yeah, I, 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 there's a distinction. You put it up on a, you set it up on a T for me. I think there's a distinction between collecting and hoarding, particularly in the pandemic genre. Because what happens in the pandemic genre, you all know this if you've seen the film, is that uh, the, 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 the sole survivor or the few individuals, they are desperate to survive. And what do they do? They hoard. But that project of hoarding, it does not entail, back to Justin's point, the kind of loving collection, uh, assemblage of objects. It's simply to survive. And often it takes the form then, and I think this is illustrative of the crisis, it just takes the form of stockpiling. Just let me get whatever I can. This is when I first stumbled across this as a feature of the genre, is that how often is it that the person who's, um, you know, uh, surviving, who's left behind, it's the walking dead, it's, you know, you've seen it in different incarnations again and again. I am legend, uh, is the person goes into a grocery store, and there's just an abundance of goods. And what do they do? They stockpile. And often what they stockpile are multiple items of the same brand. You know, the 12 pack of Gatorade. That's not collecting. <laughs> That's hoarding cereal items, which actually testifies to the crisis. And here, here's, well, you just said it, Chanel. Here's the other thing about hoarding, particularly in a pandemic, you can always run out. There's no promise of permanence. It's not like your baseball card collection, which might, in your fantasy, never go away. Unless you've watched Better Call Saul, which is a wonderful scene in which a guy has his baseball card collection stolen. By the way, total side note, I've spent my time in distraction completely obsessed with Better Call Show, the best written show on television, equal to Breaking Bad and its status. Please do yourself a favor if you haven't seen it. Footnote. And oh, one more thing along those lines. This is, this is how my mind works, okay? It is also very much related to our historical moment. A main character in that show is basically lives in quarantine because of fear of infection outside. He has an allergy to electricity and he quarantines himself. He's in a position of social distancing. Comments? I would also just say like a, the difference between a collection and hoarding, right? A collector would almost never use the items that they're collecting. They're there for them to collect, right? Right, right. Also on that point of hoarding too, like you made me think about how um, hoarding usually in itself, like to the extreme measures is considered like some, a, a type of sickness or like an illness. So it kind of brings it full circle. What you're saying is hoarding toilet paper is not the same as collecting stamps, right? <laughs> right, correct. <laughs> Good, Chanel. Anybody else? I can show you a, a, a clip from um, 28 Days Later, a good pandemic film, 2002, Danny Boyle, where you see um, 
the uh, potential objects of collection being scattered about. Um, and there, there, there seems to be no possibility of building any kind of collection. Um, and that's, that's the terror. Then I'm gonna talk about collecting people. That's where I'll, 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 move, I'll move toward the end by talking about collecting people, but we're talking about objects first. Here's 28 days later. Uh, bear with me for just a sec. Gotta pull it up. Okay, so um, just to set the scene briefly here, um, this young man has awakened um, uh, from a traumatic brain uh, injury in a hospital. And for all he knows, he's all alone. And he's, this is the very beginning of the film and he's wandering around in London, um, just, just looking for anyone. Uh, and you can see he's in a hospital gown. And just look at the objects he comes across. That's, that's what I find most interesting here. I mean, let me stop it there for a second. Notice that those are, those are souvenirs of Big Ben. I mean, that's all I probably even need to show you. There is the, the, the project of collection in crisis. And by the way, he doesn't pick one of those up. Why would he? He's not, he wants to survive, not start a souvenir collection. He ends up collecting, well, he gets some money, finds some money on the ground. Anybody else? Before I start talking about people? I might argue that it doesn't make very much sense to uh, be grabbing money if you think you're the only person there. That, well, that goes back to the hoarding, right? It's like, how much toilet paper do you need? <laughs> yes, yes. It, it, I mean, it is another way of saying it is hoarding. I really appreciate Chanel's question. Hoarding is like collecting gone mad, isn't it? It's just, it's, it's yeah, it's, that spiraled out of control, but that, that there's a similar impulse there, but. Okay. So we, I've talked about, um, and, and you can go back and watch pandemic films and you'll see a uh, collection of objects in crisis um, at, at every turn. Uh, I'll give you just a few other examples. Um, this is such a, 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 a sort of a typical, um, image in a pandemic film where the survivor has say one token of uh, remembrance from um, the past. So it's a photograph or it's a, um, a piece of clothing or it's a doll or, but that's not a collection, right? It's, it's, it's the bare remnant of a collection. And, and when the camera focuses in on that, it's a, an illustration of the deprivation the person and the exposure, the vulnerability that the person is experiencing. There's no way to immunize through the, the construction of a collection. And again, even when that character or, or any character who's surviving goes into a space where there's, where there's an abundance of goods, it's fraught. The underground pantry, it's just all tomato soup cans. You may well be able to see where I'm going with this. One of the central narrative threads in a pandemic genre is the um, desperate project to collect people. Now, what do I mean by collecting people? Um, I need to, to um, back up just a little bit and uh, go back to my uh, initial screen here. Um, I want to read this line to you. In a world where we move instantly from the incommensurate to the equivalent, likenesses are obscure. And I want to explain what I think he means by this, where we move instantly from the incommensurate to the equivalent. What I think he means is that in a, um, an increasingly globalized, urbanized world, we come across many strangers. And on the one hand, the stranger can seem 
depending on our mood, <laughs> incommensurate to us, totally unlike us, totally different. Someone who has nothing in common with us. And that's unsettling. The flip side of that, equally dark, is that, and again, depends on our mood, we can see the other as identical to us, indistinguishable from us. I will just say both of those experiences, feeling that the other is incommensurate and feeling that the other is identical, I have experienced every time I walk into a grocery store now with a mask and a bandana on. And that other person's face is covered and at one level they seem incommensurate to me. I can't recognize that person. I don't know what to make of that person. That person's incommensurate. The flip side of it is, whoa, that person's got a bandana and a mask on and they look exactly like me. <laughs> we might as well be clones of each other. These are the dark extremes of the modern experience amplified by the historical moment in which we live. The other is incommensurate, the other is identical. Let me illustrate how that plays out in the pandemic genre. The other is incommensurate. How many times do you see the protagonist come across someone else and the first response is fear? Can I trust that person? Is that person dangerous? Is that person gonna take my backpack? Is that person infected? The first response is that person's incommensurate to me. On the other side in the pandemic genre, the idea that the other is identical to me, you have the zombie. They're exactly alike. They're indistinguishable. What happens when somebody gets infected, they become exactly like everybody else who's infected. So the, the challenge that the pandemic genre has is to try to thread that needle between the other is incommensurate and the other is identical. That's what we all try to do all the time. Pre-crisis, maybe it's compounded now, amplified now in the crisis. How do we find others like us? Not incommensurate, not identical. You see that played out in the pandemic genre. And when it moves toward resolution, when there is some hope, what you find is either a sole survivor or a small group of people, they begin to build a collection of people, not identical to them, not incommensurate to them, but they have something in common, like those stamps or those shoes or those baseball cards. They all have the same mission to get to the promised land or the, no, that's not the right language to, and in, in, in I, in I'm legend, it's Vermont. <laughs> Make of that what you will. It's like, yes, we get to Vermont and that's where we'll be saved. Um, and, that, and that group of people, they, they, they are made up of people who um, seem somewhat, you know, akin to each other. They have uh, a shared sensibility. We gotta get through this together. Maybe we can help each other out. Maybe we complement each other, but they also have differences, right? What, what if one of them has the, oh man, I'm coming back to the beginning of my talk. What if one of them has the genetic differentiation that enables that whole population to survive? And that's the power of the genre, is that it offers that consolation, that curation, to find people who are alike. We have Zoom. Comments? Um, this is me again. I was just thinking um, about how you said that collections are permanent, but the genre is like a, or curation is like temporary um like how would you kind of like think about those like together as like in a collection 
Wait, 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 sorry, when you said that, I said the genre is a temporary curation? No, no, you said curation is a temporary cure, right? Yeah, well, maybe, maybe temporary is not the right adjective. It's a, um, it's a provisional cure. Okay. I mean, I think we all, we're all binging on genres now, right? So it's, it's, it's temporary in the sense that it's, it's, it doesn't resolve the, the, the real world larger issue of a cure. I don't know, Chanel, did that address your question? Yeah, I did, thanks. We take our cures where we can get them at the moment. I'm, I'm, I've drawn to a close. I, I will say uh, that, because um, I, 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 I imagine some folks are going to ask me for recommendations. Um, there is a spectacular um, South Korean film from 2013, simply called Flu. Um, and and one, of the, um, one of the reasons to watch it, um, if I may be so bold in the wake of this um, conversation or this talk, is that it illustrates the, um, the terror of the identical, the other as identical to the self in a number of fascinating ways. It, it, it's, it's this sprawling canvas and it features all sorts of uh, groups of people who terrify because they are seen as identical. So for instance, the riot police or the, the military evacuators um, and it even at one point in a, in a way that no other film I have seen has done, and this may make you not want to watch it, but it actually makes visual particles leaving the mouth and going out into the air, identical particles. That would be the other is identical. And you see it happen. I'll recommend one other film. It's called It Comes at Night. I think that's, it's a horror film, um, kind of an independent from 2017, which is really good. One of the other uh, pre-submitted questions was uh, somebody on the call was curious as to what your favorite pandemic film is. Um, yeah, that's, that, that, that's a fair question. And it's a little tricky because, you know, there, in looking back through it, there aren't many really pure pandemic films. This is where <laughs> the old genre um, does this work of consolation that is, um, that is contrived because flu and contagion are genuine pandemic films in that you see and learn about the flu or the virus extending across geographic regions and across national borders. That doesn't happen in too many other films. Um, and oftentimes, and this is again, this project of curation and consolation, it's often the case that the virus is sort of the excuse to launch the narrative, like bring the zombies in. Um, so that said, um, I, I, if, if I were to say my favorite in the sense that what I think is the most realistic, I'll go back to Contagion. I think it's really, I mean, it's prescient. It's, it's just stunning actually. Um, yeah, you saw the end of it. I mean, it, it does what, what a narrative film has to do. Um, I would also say, um, th this is, the, I, I, I'm cheating a little bit, but this is one of my favorite films of the last um, sort of a half dozen years or so. It, it might be a virus film. There's, 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 it sort of makes it a little ambiguous at the beginning. There's a leak. There's a leak in a biological laboratory. Viral? Um, it's called Train to Busan, a uh, South Korean horror film. Oh my gosh, it's, the, it's great. Zombie film, really. Train to Busan. Looks like we have a question. Um, Gayla, if you want to unmute your mic and ask it. Hi, I was just curious about post-pandemic. We're in the midst of a pandemic right now, but if the pandemic became so severe and billions of people wiped from the 
the planet. You know, when we think about what happened in 1919 when there were 25 to 50 million people then, and 50% of the population. Um, and your infrastructure collapses, what would become the new mode of currency to get water, to get food, if the financial systems were all gone? I think I heard that. Did, did anyone hear that better than I? Um, you're muted. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I unmuted. Can you hear me now? I, yeah, I hear you a little more clearly now, yes. Okay. Um, I can try to actually open up my visual if that would help. Sure. I don't know if that would matter or not. Well, we hear you uh, really well now. You're being a little less of an absent presence. <laughs> All right. You, okay, so you can hear me. I can hear you, yes. Okay, so I'm working on a script now, which is about a post-pandemic world mm -hmm. where everything collapses. So you think about 1919, where 50% of the population has been wiped out. And assuming the governmental infrastructure is all gone and people are needing to figure out currency or a way to get water, to do some kind of commerce, I'm just wondering what you would see as the valuable mode of you know, for a currency. Right. Because dollars wouldn't exist. You know, and I've looked at a lot of dystopia types of worlds and they never really get into what the currency is. People seem to have money, but it doesn't mean anything. Gold will it mean anything. Right. It could be a total barter system. Yeah, that, that, that's what I would think. Else. Yeah, it, it, it returns to a barter system. Yeah, which I, I'm sorry to, to wrench it back into um, my uh, preoccupations here, but the barter system, again, also undermines the possibility of the reassurance of the collection, because then everything is potentially exchangeable. Nothing is taken out of circulation. There's no opportunity to, you know, uh, begin building your stamp collection because right. you, you want to exchange it for something else. The barter system. Um, looks like we have another question from Sean, if you'd like to ask it, Sean. Oh, okay. It looks like he doesn't have audio, so I will read it. Um, are you surprised by the willingness to accept the dehumanizing effect of infection? Um, for example, in The Walking Dead, the protagonist's heroes, or per heroes kill and murder thousands of people but it is presented as okay because they have been infected. Um, that's always troubled me about The Walking Dead. Also, he gave you kudos for the presentation and thank you. Oh, thank you, Sean. <laughs> uh, yes, I mean, it, I guess it, that, that's, that's a matter of, um, dare I say it, taste um, and one's, one's comfort level within the genre. Um, you know, how, 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 how well does it suit you? Um, but yes, I, I've, I was troubled by some of the violence in The Walking Dead. Yeah. Um, and and it, it's probably a testament to your sensitivity that you're refusing to see the other as identical. You know, that you, you, you're, you're wanting to, um, to your credit, individualize the other um, and resisting that impulse. I, I can't remember the specifics of The Walking Dead <laughs> to give you an example, but I, I'm thinking that there may have been instances where that happens in The Walking Dead. I know it happens in other um, installations of the genre where even after somebody's turned, there's this sympathy, that, 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 that uh, impulse to individualize. How would you say the zombie genre differs from the pandemic genre, or or do they kind of fit with one within one another? They do, yeah, yeah. And I, you know, I began by saying, well, the genre, um, you know, creates these um, comfortable boundaries, but those boundaries are um, can be rubbery, right? Uh, they can be expansive, so that um, you know, you can have the the zombie film that also sort of falls into the pandemic film. Yeah, they're fairly closely related, um, but not identical. Uh, Flu is not a zombie film. It Comes at Night is not a zombie film. Contagion is not a zombie film. Uh, 
Um, I have one other that was submitted. Do you, hmm, actually two others. Are there any pandemic comedies out there that you recommend? <laughs> yes, but it's not fictional. Mark Maron's recent um, stand-up co comedy uh, special on Netflix titled End Times Fun. But otherwise, I'm not trying to dodge the question. It's hard, to, I, I can't, well, Zombieland. Although I'm not sure that that's not really a pandemic film, but that's a lot of fun. <clears throat> And then one other question was, do you have a favorite genre movie? Movie genre, I suppose. Movie genre. Well, I think part of the reason I was invited is that I teach um, courses on, on different genres. Um, I teach a course on the Western. I teach a course on gangster film. I teach a course on detective films. And um, I, I'll, I'll skirt this just slightly by saying, I can't say it's my favorite, but... Um, for the last few years, I've um, become convinced that the Western um, is a genre that is um, indispensable to understanding um, the American past and the American imagination and American anxieties and frustrations. And I can um, give you, well, I'd be happy to talk at great length about that. Um, there are traces of the Western in pandemic film where you have the, uh, the I Am Legend begins with Will Smith um, hunting down deer in the wilderness that is Manhattan. It's right out of a Western. He's on the frontier. It's been transformed. But the Westerns had such an impact on not just the history of cinema, but on the history of culture, particularly American culture, and also the way others perceive Americans. Look what's happening in Idaho right now with uh, Eamon Bundy and company, the, those who uh, refuse to um, submit to uh, the uh, policies regarding sh uh, shutdown. I mean, it's straight out of Western mythology, cowboy mentality. You may have all seen that now famous photograph of a showdown, a literal showdown in Denver between a healthcare worker and a woman leaning out of a car saying, I get to go where I want. It's a Western. I'm happy to give you many recommendations for contemporary Westerns. Does anybody have any other questions? I do. Hi, Claire. Uh, hi, it's been a while. Coming yeah. in from LA. Yeah. Uh, uh, do you see a pandemic film class in your future? Ah, uh, right. I, you know what? Now that now that I've been so kindly invited to do this, and and my mind started rolling. You, you know, I, it, it, that's a really good question because um, faculty. Um, far and wide across the university have been wrestling with the extent to which this material addressing the current moment ought to be incorporated into the classroom. And there are understandably conflicting views about this. On the one hand, it's, well, let's, let's talk about this. Let's process this. Let's try to work through this. And then there's another camp where the, the logic is, no, let's, let's, let's step away from this. Let's enable people to think about something else. So I'm I'm honestly a little torn. And anyway, on the books for next fall, I'm teaching a course on AI and cinema, which I had all queued up for the crisis hit. So. What, what films are on that syllabus? Um, both Blade Runner films. Um, Frank, I begin with Frankenstein, 2001 A Space Odyssey. By the way, that, that clip from Contagion at the end, 2001 Space Odyssey reference. Um, uh, what else is on there? Frankenstein, Blade Runner, uh, Ex Machina, Her, which may be the best one of them all. I highly recommend that film. That's the one that does AI the best, I think. Um, I know there are others. Minority Report, maybe. Can I share a story with you? Or, I don't want uh, to hog the light. Sure, jo jo and then we'll go back. I think Joanna has a question after. No, she, she should go, yeah. Joanna? 
Oh, you want me to start? Hey, this is Joanne. I'm a calm 2004. I am a self-proclaimed wuss when it comes to scary movies. And I have yet to watch any of these pandemic like films. I just don't do well with violence or like suspense. Which one would be the least frightening to watch? Oh gosh. Wow. Is, is it, is it, um, is it physical violence that's most disturbing or is it no, psychological? That's just like everything, anything that will make me jump or fear or I so maybe think. like a PG-13 type one. Oh man. Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. It's <laughs> <laughs> great. It's like, I can't help you. <laughs> Bold. I will try that out. Yeah, no, that's great. That's yeah. Um, no, that's not, that's, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's good. It's not, it has nothing to do with this, but, um, yeah. Thanks. I, I, I wish I could, I wish I could offer you one, but I, as I'm looking at my list, yeah, my wife's the same way. Yeah. <laughs> Maybe some of the older ones too, just cause they're so outdated with like graphics and technology. I might think they're a little right. paper. So. Right. You, you know what's a great film? It's not, it's again, it's not a pandemic film unless you really squint your eyes is the 1956 film Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Mm -hmm. And so that's in black and white. Um, and there's no, you know, there's no, yeah, you can watch it. <laughs> it's, it's a, uh, you know, a Hayes Code film. So it's, it's censored to the point where you'll, you can manage it. That's, awesome. that's important culturally. I recommend that. Thanks. Sure. Do you want to share your story before we finish up? Oh, no, I'm, I'm, I'm Oh, no, go, go for it. Right there. No, I was just, how, Claire was asking about how, you know, could I incorporate pandemics? And I, uh, don't get me started because I'll talk about this forever, but I teach this course on Breaking Bad, which is like one of the great works of art of the 21st century. Just, just, it just is. And, um, and the, the, the day, the, 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 the class session that was scheduled for the day we went online. So the week after we learned we were quarantined was the incredible episode that occurs halfway through the um, show called Fly, in which the main character, Walter White, who's a meth cook, I'm not giving anything right about the plot so far, is basically stuck for the whole episode in a room with a fly. He's bugged by a pest. And he keeps talking about having to decontaminate. And it was just striking. It was just, I mean, well, here we are, guys. <clears throat> and that's, you know, that's a pleasure as an instructor because then it's, oh, look at this coincidence. We can look what we can make of this. On the other hand, it was, do we really want to talk about <laughs> Can we just talk about the show? <laughs> Brian Cranston's great, isn't he? <clears throat> no, thank you so much. Um, are there any other last minute questions? If not, I'll thank William. Um, okay. Sort of semi-related, what's your favorite Western? Oh my gosh. My favorite Western? Um, I'm gonna dodge that by giving you folks films to watch that, will, that, that are not, um, you know, John Wayne films, okay? <laughs> Cause that's, it's, it's, the Western is John Wayne or Jimmy Stewart or, um, it's Clint Eastwood. Um, there are contemporary Westerns that are absolutely beautiful and, um, and revisionary, feminist. Um, there's, there's one that was made a couple years ago by an Asian American woman named Chloe Zhao. It's simply called The Rider, R-I-D-E-R, -E um, which is set on the Lakota Reservation in South Dakota. Um, that's a beautiful film. Should have won an Oscar. Uh, anything by Kelly Reichardt, the independent filmmaker. Um, is worth your time. Kelly Reichardt's a really important American filmmaker, and many of her films have a Western inflection to them. R I, I'm sorry, R E I C H A R D T. Kelly Reichardt. The one that I've taught is um, Meek's Cutoff, which is wonderful. She's got, she's, she had one that was just about to come out before the crisis hit called, I think it's First Cow, like C O W, set in the West. Um, oh, well, Mad Max Fury Road's a Western. It's captivity narrative, set in a desert. Trucks instead of horses. I teach it in the Western. That's a great film. And it's a feminist 
So. Great, yeah, gosh. Well, Django and Chain is pretty good. <laughs> I, I could go on. <laughs> no, thank you for sharing those recommendations. I know uh, personally I have added quite a few movies to my queue <laughs> during this time uh, since we might be doing this for the considerable future, another week or two, maybe optimistically, who knows. Um, but thank you for sharing about the pandemic genre and thank you everybody for tuning in today. It was really great to see so many people and thank you to the UVA Entertainment Club of LA as well. Um, for those of you who are interested, just a little announcement, um, UVA Clubs does do a weekly on-air uh, program that features a UVA faculty speaker. It's a little bit different than this kind of program in that you call in on your phone. Um, it's not a video Zoom meeting. So if you're interested in tuning in for those, they occur weekly um, and you can just find the list for it on the uvaclubs.virginia.edu. But thank you so, so much for joining today. And thank you again, William. Thank you, folks. Be well.